Let's do this. Uh, I have my headset on to record this, and um, I feel a little bit like Britney Spears in the 90s. So, <laughs> okay, today we're talking about Babyface from 1933. It's a very cute, cuddly title for a film that was uh, uh, a bit not cute and cuddly. <laughs> There's lots of cuddling in it. Anyway, <laughs> getting off track. So, as I said, 1933, this one stars Barbara Stanwyck as Lily Powers. There's also uh, George Brent and John, uh, John Wayne makes a little cameo. Although it wasn't really a cameo at the time, it's one of his really early roles, so he wasn't big yet. He's only 25, just a baby himself. It was directed by Alfred E. Green. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. So let's start with the plot, because that's a good place to begin. Because this film is only short, and it's interesting. Uh, so like, I want to tell you about what happens in the film. So this is going to contain some spoilers but you should watch it anyway, because it's a good film. And I don't think that anything I'm gonna tell you is really gonna like spoil it for you that much. Um, so Lily Powers is our main character. She's a barmaid at her father's uh, speakeasy during pro prohibition, prohibition. <laughs> and um, he has been basically uh, making her sleep with customers since she was 14 so that's where we're at I know you really wouldn't expect that to come up in a film but this is pre-production code anyway so she basically has only two friends in the world and everybody else is sort of willing to like use her including her own father right so there's a man who's a friend and he wants her to read like Nietzsche and aspire to greater things and that kind of thing. And then there's her coworker and best friend who is a woman called Chico. So uh, when Lily's father is killed in a speakeasy related accident, Lily and Chico hop a train to the big city, but it's not all smooth sailing. Lily just uh, decides to take back her power by flirting and sleeping with people to get what she needs, get out of trouble, and get what she wants from life. Um, I don't know if you could hear that. Grim is asleep, and he's talking in his sleep. He's so cute. Uh, where was I? So yeah, she basically is doing this to get her needs met, um, because she can't get ahead any other way, basically. So she uses this skill to get legitimate work in a bank and then rise to the top of, of that field. So as she starts to succeed, she gets out of some interesting fixes from being caught in a flagrante and not getting fired to using getting caught kissing the man engaged to the vice president's daughter. She leverages that to get a beautiful apartment and uh, a relationship with a man higher up the ladder, the, the first vice president himself. Uh, which is great for a while, but ends pretty badly. So uh, later her scandalous behavior comes out and she uses a situation. So she initially tries to leverage the situation by saying she's going to publish a diary and she almost gets um, 15 grand, which in the, I can't even imagine how much money that would have been in the 1930s. But anyway, uh, but instead she gets the offer of a transfer to the Paris office. So the thing is, the film frames this as her being the little guy sticking it to the man. So in a weird kind of way, she's kind of relatable, shockingly, or at least she's sympathetic. She's a sympathetic character. She does a lot with the little that she has, and she's really loyal to her best friend. So the turning point in her life comes in Paris or the turning point of the film um, she works really hard there and keeps her nose clean and that means that Cortland he's the man that saw through her earlier in the story and had her move to Paris instead of giving her the cash um, he's a little bit impressed uh, so part of what's lovely about them is that he sees through her innocent ve veneer 
and so he thinks that she's a like a grifter but when they're in Paris he starts to kind of see through that and see the human being struggling to make it in a in a difficult world and he sees her determination and charm and so that's really nice and she sees somebody who isn't a fool isn't fooled by her you know behavior but he also isn't using her he genuinely sees her and he's not just kind of um yeah he's not using her so they fall in love and it's sweet but there's a test this is a film from the 30s after all so um whilst they start to uh, live in marital bliss and all this kind of stuff and he has loads of money and she's really happy there's a problem at the bank and Cortland becomes the fall guy for the bank's money mismanagement basically so he needs all the money and uh, you know like jewelry and stuff like that all the things he's given her to the value of a million dollars ladies <laughs> He needs all of that back for his defense. So the question is, will she help him or will she take the money and run? Well, she takes the money and run. She actually bails. <laughs> she um, packs up or like kind of rather brusquely asks Chico, her friend, to pack everything up for her. Because basically she's really been through it and she's not going to go through it again. And considering where she's come from, it's kind of not an unreasonable response in a way. Um, like... I remember what her father made her do at 14 so keep it in mind she's not gonna go backwards in life she's decided but after she leaves she can't go through with it and she runs back to her man so the ending is super dramatic and actually pretty sweet so I don't want to spoil those final moments by telling you how it turns out and what happens um, but yeah, that's that's the film. So there's kind of a lot there. So um, this was based on a story by Daryl F. Zanuck, who you may have heard of. Uh, he wrote it under the pen name Mark Canfield, and I I couldn't find out why he did that. But this film was pretty racy, so I kind of wonder if maybe he didn't necessarily want to put his name on it or something like that um, but anyway this was a Warner Brothers movie trying to one-up MGM because they had Jean Harlow and she was in a vehicle called Red-Headed Woman that was kind of a similar sort of you know similar kind of story because this was the Great Depression and the film industry was struggling um, Zanuck just asked for a nominal one dollar for the script in payment rather than taking more on top of his regular pay which he was would be entitled to but he just took his regular you know he got a weekly amount and he just took that so his regular pay was actually quite a lot it was like um 3.5 k a week or something so he, he wasn't exactly like slumming it but anyway um some people at the studios were actually taking voluntary pay cuts because studios were really struggling so this was kind of the kind of thing that happened sometimes in the 30s or people would kind of do this kind of thing that he did to um, help studios stay open so the film had the tagline <laughs> she had it and made it pay <laughs> and there's a pretty open conversation about sex at the start of the film so this was one of the movies that ushered in the era of the production code, which was a precursor to the rating system that we kind of have now. Uh, it was pretty notorious for being like a racy, um, you know, salacious kind of movie, I guess. Um, although in a way that's not really what the film is about. That's just kind of part of it. Uh, so the production code was ushered in in 1930, but it wasn't really more rigidly enforced until 34 and lasted until 68. It was adopted as a form of self-censorship. So um, basically it was agreement to what could be shown on screen. And then there were certain things that could no longer be allowed in films. Though there are films that would kind of push the limits and stretch them sometimes. Basically at that time, when you went to the movies you would just kind of walk in and there would be films playing like on a loop and so that meant that everybody was seeing the same films so there wasn't 
the case where children wouldn't see this film or something like that. So um, the censorship was designed so that children wouldn't be corrupted and general decency wouldn't be offended and, and that kind of thing. So basically every movie would be sort of like G or a PG um, kind of level, if that makes sense. Um, later we would come up with um, the rating system which would tell you sort of who the intended audience might be as far as like uh, I suppose it's like age really isn't it like um, G general admission or parental guidance recommended that kind of thing so we have that now which is um, kind of makes a lot of sense really uh, but they didn't do that then anyway suffice to say <laughs> the film was censored and had quite a few cuts to it um, and so because of that the film was actually lost for a while the original version but it was found in 2004 so you can now see it in the way it's meant to be seen the things that were cut were just um, rather than Lily getting advice to kind of take back the power that's been taken away from her like to use the system against itself she was kind of like made to be a bit more like shamed um, for her behavior so which isn't really the point of the film but it was like the ending had to be that she didn't uh, profit from being a bad person sort of thing but I mean really she's not really a bad person in this movie like she's not uh, cold-hearted or calculating she's just doing what she thinks is the only thing she can do so um, let me think so I guess what I kind of wanted to maybe talk about first is Chico because I think a lot of what I was looking at as far as looking at the behind the scenes stuff for this and and researching and stuff like that Chico is the best friend and she's played by Teresa Harris and she's a, a black character black person and she shares equal screen time with Barbara Stanwyck who plays Lily Powers but her billing or like you have to kind of look for her in the credits or in the cast it sort of has like Barbara Stanwyck and like the other actors way before her but she shares equal screen time with Barbara Stanwyck so I felt like that was a bit um, unfair because she's pretty important in this movie so she plays the best friend she's always at Lily's side and Lily stands up for her against her um, own father which is a lot when you think about it and she takes her with her and always shares everything that she has um, so as a so Chico is black and even though sometimes she's the comic relief sometimes as a lot of black ac black actors were forced to be in this time period she's subversively often not just the comic relief so this friendship between the two of them helps us see that Lily is loyal and has feelings for the people that matter to her she's not hard-hearted she's not a bad person she's just using the system around her for her own ends instead of people using her she's using them uh, as I mentioned Lily stands up to her father for Chico later one of her lovers asks her to send away Chico and kind of you know makes a comment and um, Lily like really point-blank refuses like you know so that's I think that's really nice later in the film as Lily's star is kind of on the rise Chico works as her maid which to me felt a little bit yuck I was kind of a little bit disappointed but um, reading about it a little bit more I kind of realized like their relationship is still warm and it's not really that of like maid and employer they're still like I mean the job title would be made but now I think it would be like personal assistant or something if you see what I mean so to me Chico is the beating heart of this film she's um, as I said she was played by Teresa Harris and one of Teresa Harris's big claims to fame is that she appeared with more stars of the golden era of Hollywood than anyone else she was in so many things and she was in movies with everyone at a bunch of different studios as well so 
Because of the way films were written at the time, she was often relegated to sort of side roles as a maid, because that's kind of how black people were cast in this era. But she often used the roles that she did have to show that she was more than a stereotype and an actress with a lot of talent and different, lots of different talents as well. This is most clearly seen in this film. And as I mentioned, she shares equal screen time with Stanwyck, which is really unusual for this time period. Uh, but she also shines in a film called Professional Sweetheart of 1933 film, where she gets to show Ginger Rogers a thing or two. So that's pretty cool. Behind the scenes, she was very hardworking and easy to get along with and well liked, which meant that directors and co-workers always tried to make sure she got a little bit more screen time, a few extra lines, and that she was allowed to do a little bit more with a role than just simply what was written on, pa on the paper, on the page. So I think that's pretty cool. Unlike a lot of Hollywood stars who didn't all come to good ends, uh, which makes for you know interesting story, but um, happily, Teresa Harris was really smart with her money and she saved a lot of money from working on films and she ended up marrying a doctor and had a good life after her um, filmmaking. But she did make like about 90 films. Like that's a lot. That's more than Barbara Stanwyck. So yeah, she's a champion. Um, so to talk more, a little bit more about the actors in this, um, as I mentioned, Barbara Stanwyck is Lily Powers in this movie. So she was a big star known for her strong, realistic characters and also for being able to do many different genres because she could, you know, she could play funny, but she could also play drama. Like she's really um, versatile. She made 85 films in 38 years. And interestingly, she was actually an orphan and she was obsessed with work. Like her life revolved around her work. So perhaps these two facts make her enter Lily's character so well. And she actually um, built up some of the lines of her character in those early scenes in this film where she's being established, like what she's been through and who she is and stuff. So it's interesting. Um, so George Brent plays Cortland. He kind of comes in later in the film. Um, so there's quite a few men playing opposite her, but you might know him better for films he made with Betty Davis, like Jezebel and Dark Victory. He was rumored to have a, had an affair with Betty Davis, uh, and she was... Oh, I mixed up my notes. So yeah, he was rumored to have had an affair with Betty Davis, which was kind of interesting. But what I didn't mention about uh, Barbara Stanwyck, because my notes were mixed up, is that she was actually said to be the inspiration for the couple in A Star Is Born. Um, so she started out in like theater and her husband came from that background as well. And when she moved across to films, she got a lot of work and started to become more and more su successful. And he didn't really break into films very well. So they later divorced after he took up heavily drinking so yeah uh, as I mentioned briefly John Wayne is in this film uh, he's starting out in his career he's only 25 and he plays one of Lily's lovers amongst many others many other actors so this one was directed by Alfred E Green he had a super long directing career like some of these directors did from the 1910s to the 50s and he was married to a silent film star called Vivian Reed. Uh, he directed Betty Davis in 1935's Dangerous, which she won the Oscar for, um, but just for fun, he, here are some of his films that I'm sharing based on their just great and slightly hilarious titles. I have never seen these. I couldn't see anything else in his filmography that I had seen that I would be like, oh, he did this and this, right? But listen to these titles. Silk Husbands and Calico Wives. The Ghost Breaker. I would love to see that. Uh, Back Home and Broke. Relatable. In Hollywood with Potash and Pearl Mutter. The Man Who Found Himself. The Rich. <laughs> the Rich Are Always With Us. 
I don't know why I find that so funny. Like, I've heard that phrase before, but it just tickles me, like, as if they're watching you. Uh, the Merry Frinks. They met in a taxi, which sounds like a Paul Schrader movie to me. And The League of Frightened Men, which I guess could be an alternative title for this film. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so this isn't a hugely long film, it's only an hour and 10 minutes, but I think it's a really, really interesting one because it's pre-code. People could get away with a lot more. And this is one of the films that really, you know, it was kind of so shocking that it kind of helped usher in the era of the production code when lots and lots of things were banned. The thing with this film that I really like, other than a bunch of things I've already mentioned, but the thing that kind of strikes me about this movie is that people like to think of the time before the 60s as a kind of innocent time, like women were feminine and men were this and like whatever, right? But it really wasn't like that at all. So this movie is one of many pre-production movies that kind of shows how people were more sympathetic and understood women like Lily who had to survive somehow and didn't have a lot of options, maybe came from nothing and built themselves into something. And yeah, I mean, people and society were really not that different, but the production code imposed a shame and morality on things and meant that things couldn't be shown on screen not that they weren't happening. So the censored film tries to shame Lily a little bit and kind of has a different sort of ending where she can't profit by what she's doing and this kind of stuff. Uh, but the original film doesn't have that message. What it did was show how life numbed Lily. What happened to her made her numb. And by having to survive, she couldn't, like people didn't treat her as a human being, so she didn't really treat them that way. And it's kind of funny, like sometimes in the movie, I was like, oh my gosh. And she's always kind of getting into this situation, but she gets out, she talks her way out of it. You know, there's kind of like a little bit of humor there to me maybe. But the real point of this film is that when somebody treats her well and really cares about her, she's melted by real love. She thaws out. And when she finds that, she's able to really live and really feel. As I said before, Lily is cunning, but she's not cold and calculating. And I mean, yeah, her her friendship with Chico is like really, it's nice, you know? So it's a, it's a film where there's kind of layers to it in that sense. And uh, I just think it's one of those ones where you might be a little startled and shocked by seeing something that feels so modern and so brazen from what is almost a hundred years ago. So, yeah. So that is Babyface from 1933 with Barbara Stanwyck. Um, I will have another film for you guys soon to share with you. Um, so thank you for hanging out with me again. Um, somebody left a comment, which I loved, that they watched one of my videos before watching the movie with their, uh, I can't remember if it was a grandmother or a grandfather, but it was very sweet because they were like, I could understand what I was watching a bit more because I'd watched your videos. It was like having primer notes or something. And I think that's really nice. I think it's really nice to watch a film with people who are different generations. And it's lovely to watch a film with somebody who is potentially from the generation where that film was more modern or came out when they were alive or whatever whether that's something fairly recent or something really old I just think that's really fun so um, thank you for that comment and um, maybe I don't know if this is the kind of film you would watch with a grandparent but <laughs> um, but yeah I just think that's really lovely so films bring people together and I think that's cool so yeah, uh, as per usual, you can um, find me on social media. I am Hermione Flavia 
on Instagram if you want to look for me there. I talk about books there a lot. I do have a podcast, Tea and Scandal. It's not about movies. Um, it's about lots of different things. It's more about life, I guess. So that is uh, kicking around on all of the, I think on all of the, um, where you get your podcast places. And yeah, that's pretty much it, actually. <laughs> I was like, what else do I have? I do have I do have Twitch as well, which I think is Craven Wild. So you can find me there. And thank you for watching. <laughs>